So this image here uh, was used by the World Meteorological Organization in their last State of the Climate report. And it's showing the change in global temperatures from 1850 through to 2018. And each stripe represents the temperature for a, a single year. And when it's color coded uh, from blue from the very cool temperatures uh, going through to red as temperatures are warming. So we can see towards the end of the uh, 19th century, there's some particularly cool events which are re uh, related to some volcanic eruptions. Uh, we have uh, a bit of warming seen around the 30s and 40s. The temperatures came a bit more stable in the 1960s, and from 1980s on, we've seen a dramatic uh, warming of the global climate. And also, as we've heard from our previous speakers, we've seen a dramatic expansion in the global distribution of dengue. So we, uh, in the 1970s, uh, there were nine countries reporting severe outbreaks, and that, that has now expanded to more than 100 countries, and the WHO has estimated that half the world's population is now at risk. So we know, as mentioned by the previous speakers, a lot of this is to do with uh, inadequate uh, living conditions. This here is one of the, the biggest favelas in Rio de Janeiro, uh, the Hoshina slum. So we can see these very uh, packed people living in inadequate packed together places depending on uh, temporary water storage containers and this provides the perfect uh, breeding ground for the for dengue outbreaks to to initiate we know that part of the expansion of dengue is due to um, international travel allowing humans to introduce the disease to new places uh, trade has allowed um, invasive mosquito species to establish with the warming temperatures the vector has been able to expand to higher latitudes and altitudes and is eroding the, the traditional limits to these diseases. And within this, um, short-term extreme weather events, such as storms, droughts, and floods, can affect the timing and intensity of these outbreaks. So we want to know if we can use forecasts of the climate conditions to try and predict in advance when we might be more likely to see a dengue outbreak. So I'm based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, my group is focusing on trying to develop de decision support systems uh, to help manage climate sensitive diseases. And today I'm going to focus on uh, giving some examples of the work we've done trying to develop uh, dengue early warning system frameworks uh, for dengue. So one of our challenges is how we to try and see how we can transform this wealth of satellite data uh, environmental observations and climate forecasts into something that is used, usable and actionable by decision makers. And our goal is to try and shift from a surveillance framework where we're relying on outbreaks happening or purely on surveillance systems to try and incorporate um, Earth observation data to, to try and understand how climate conditions might be impacting the vectors and indeed human behavior. And that gives us a, um, some lead time to be able to intervene. And we want to take that a step further and increase, increase our lead time using forecasts of the climate conditions. But at the same time, we need to appreciate the um, additional levels of uncertainty that are introduced by using forecasts of the climate to try and predict a complex disease like dengue. So this here is an example. Uh, this map is showing um, the skill of uh, seasonal climate forecast, this particular map is looking at the skill of temperature forecasts over a 30-year period. So this is a generalized rock skill score where the greener, um, blue to purple colors are showing areas. Uh, these are for the months of uh, May, March, and uh, uh, March, April, and May. So we can see windows of opportunity for this particular season where we may have some reliable seasonal climate forecasts. So we have areas of Brazil, um, parts of other parts of South America, the Caribbean, parts of Southeast Asia as well. So I'm going to give you some examples of work we've developed in Brazil, Ecuador, Barbados, and Vietnam. And I'm going to start off uh, describing our, our experience of developing an early warning system in Brazil. So this started uh, during my PhD research. I was working in an um, international uh, team of climate scientists and epidemiologists, uh, working on a project trying to see how we could use seasonal climate forecast um, for decision-making in several sectors in agriculture, hydropower, and public health. 
and I was focusing on trying to develop um, models to understand the spatial and temporal distribution of dengue with colleagues at the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation in Brazil. So we worked together incorporating all um, the environmental and climate information we had across Brazil uh, with socioeconomic indicators and we developed a, a Bayesian probabilistic uh, model to try and um, understand and predict the risk. And then we were asked uh, to put our work into practice ahead of the 2014 World Cup when the Ministry of Health were developing a, an action plan to try and um, increase their um, control and surveillance um, ahead of the games. And they were interested to know, using our model, uh, what the prediction looked like based on climate information. And they were particularly interested in, in the places where the, the games were to be taking place. So using our model, uh, in February 2014, uh, we received the seasonal climate forecast from the um, CPTEC, the Centre for um, Climate Prediction in Brazil. And by the end of that month, we were provided with the latest dengue cases from the Ministry of Health, uh, which was by no means perfect, but it was the best information we had to incorporate into our model at the time. We combined all this information, and by March, we were able to put together a probabilistic um, dengue forecast for the month of June. So this gave us um, a predictive lead time of three months. So before the games took place in June 2014, we published um, our probabilistic uh, risk map in the Lancet Infectious Diseases. So this map here shows us um, the probability of uh, different risk categories of dengue, if you like. So in Brazil, a uh, high risk is considered greater than 300 cases per 100,000 population. So areas where we can see uh, saturated colors of, of red are showing that our model, um, there was a high certainty of exceeding this threshold. Whereas uh, intense colors of blue is showing that there was a high probability of low risk of the disease. So our, um, our publication, our results, was uh, advertised uh, widely. It was included um, in the BBC, um, on the NHS website, and within the ECDC risk assessment for travellers uh, going to Brazil. And after the event, uh, we were able to compare how our forecast compared to um, the actual observed cases. So what was the probability of observing the correct category? So this map here shows us um, the probability of the uh, correct category. So we can see, for example, in the south of Brazil, where there is very little dengue, our model um, correctly predicted that because it, it, it knows that the, the climate conditions and the population structures are not so conducive to uh, the spread of dengue. There were some um, correct forecasts of high risk in the northeast, and these maps here um, break this down by risk category. And we can see that there were some places uh, where the model missed a high-risk category, but generally the model produced a lot more successful predictions than, uh, uh, than missed uh, opportunities. So one of the things that helps us use seasonal climate forecasts is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So when we have a warming of uh, the sea surface temperatures in the Pacific, uh, this can create El Nino events, which impacts the climate in remote locations. And I have been working with uh, partners in Ecuador, which is a place which is particularly sensitive to El Nino events. And when they occur, we tend to have um, much warmer and wetter conditions than usual. This map here is just showing the correlation between the sea surface temperatures in the Pacific and uh, rainfall um, across the globe. So we can see... Uh, this southern coastal area of Ecuador is a hot spot. Uh, also down in the sort of north of Argentina is, a, is another hot spot. So in 2016, uh, the city of Machala experienced uh, one of the worst flooding events it had since the, 2000, that, since the 1998 El Nino event. And this created um, favorable conditions for um, dengue outbreaks. So we wanted to see how well, we could uh, do you developing a model based on climate information to see if we could predict uh, the timing of a dengue outbreak. And we wanted to compare this to the current practice. So in Ecuador, as in many countries, decisions are usually based on the epidemiological situation uh, that's determined from the um, seasonal cycle over the last five years. So here we can just see 
the mean um, dengue cases based on the last five years of data and the upper 95% confidence interval. So this is showing um, a forecast based on our model, which uh, used an ensemble of seasonal climate forecasts for both um, temperature and precipitation, along with a, a model for the, um, to predict the evolution of El Nino. And according to our model, there was a, a, a high probability of exceeding the, um, the five-year average in March. So relying on the, uh, the, the, the annual cycle from the previous years, we would have expected a peak in June, but our model suggested there may be a peak in March. And then after the event, uh, there was indeed a, a peak in March, and we think this could have been related to these, uh, this extreme uh, flooding event that happened. So the sources of predictability in our model uh, was the, these ensembles. So we had 24 ensemble members from a, a climate model giving us forecasts from uh, the month of January through to the, to the end of the year. And here we can see superimposed, the, the dashed black line shows the actual, observed, um, the actual observed precipitation and temperature. And seasonal climate forecasts are not always reliable, but in this particular year, thanks to the El Nino event, uh, nearly all models were able to pick up this uh, peak in precipitation which led to this uh, localized flooding. We were also very lucky to have access to some active surveillance data, uh, which confirmed that the majority of the reported dengue cases in 2015 were in fact actually chikungunya. So we were able to um, correct the passive surveillance data and incorporate this into our uh, model fitting exercise. Uh, this year, we've uh, been working to produce a similar forecast for 2019. Uh, there's a very weak El Nino event, and it looks our, our forecast is suggesting that there will be not a high risk of dengue outbreaks, which seems to be confirmed so far throughout the year. So this allows uh, the public health services in Machala to focus their, their resources towards other more pressing problems this year, for example, the, the, the migrant crisis um, from Venezuela, which is overwhelming their public health systems at the moment. We've also been working with partners in the Caribbean uh, on a project uh, which has been coordinated by the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. Uh, so there's been a huge concern that uh, measures that have been taken to try and adapt to climate change in Barbados, which is a um, water-scarce country, uh, recommendations were made to uh, install uh, water storage containers below um, large buildings, and this, in fact, has had the unintended consequence of creating additional breeding sites. And the public health services had, had begun to notice a change in the epidemiology of uh, dengue and the timings of outbreaks. So they asked us to explore um, how the climate uh, conditions might be impacting this. So this here shows um, we have uh, the month against years from um, 2000 through to 2016. Here we can see the red shading here is showing us when El Nino events are happening, and the brown shading is showing us when drought events were happening. So we have it seeing these El Nino-induced drought events, which were also um, seem to be linked with some dengue outbreaks. And we on, wanted to understand how drought combined with other climate conditions might be impacting uh, dengue. So we produced a model that looked at um, the whole distribution of um, of climate related to the risk of dengue. And we found that there was an increased risk um, following extreme drought conditions. Um, so if, when we observed a drought, and this was followed three to four months later by extremely wet and warm conditions, this was the ideal combination of climate conditions for a dengue outbreak. So we combined all our, um, our probabilistic model and uh, tried to produce some predictions of exceeding um, a moving um, epidemic threshold. And so here we hope to see uh, uh, a high risk of um, dengue when outbreaks actually occurred, which are marked by a cross. So we can see in some years we were able to produce successful predictions, particularly in 2007, um, 10, and 2013. The last few models, uh, sorry, the last few years we were unable to produce successful predictions and we think this is partly due to the introduction of the, um, the other arboviruses, uh, chikungunya and Zika. And, and so our model, uh, we would like to incorporate some more accurate uh, active surveillance information into our model to, to correct for this. 
So our uh, research has provided some additional ev evidence for the report, such as the Caribbean Health Climat Climatic Bulletin. This is a, um, a piece of, uh, this is a document that is produced on a quarterly basis, which informs um, public health decision makers in, in many different sectors how the climate might impact their particular areas. And a, and a focus has been placed now on uh, highlighting how important it is to uh, take good care of water storage containers, particularly um, following drought events. And we've uh, now working, thanks to the UK Space Agency, uh, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine with partners at HR Wallingford to try and implement a uh, operational dengue early warning system for Vietnam. So we're developing uh, this online platform where seasonal climate forecasts from the UK Met Office will be incorporated uh, with our uh, dengue um, early warning system model to try and produce um, an operational dengue early warning system. This here is uh, Oliver Brady. He's uh, with some colleagues of ours in Vietnam providing some training uh, on uh, how to sort of understand and interpret this kind of information. And the la launch of our event, of our event was, uh, was included in the, uh, the BBC News in Vietnamese. So I hope that that is a positive report. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to um, invite you all to the launch of our new Centre on Climate Change and Planetary Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. This will be live streamed uh, next Thursday afternoon on the 30th of May. And I really hope that as we move forward uh, towards raising awareness to dengue, we will consider this in terms of climate change and in a planetary health context. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions. <laughs> <laughs>